Last week, if you were with us, we were looking at uh, a man by the name of uh, Jan Mathis. Um, he's going to end up having lots of names before he's done. Um, but um, I, I mentioned to you that he, uh, by all descriptions, uh, looked like he walked off the cover of a Led Zeppelin album. Uh, long, black, flowing robes, long, pointed beard, um, again, a little bit like um, uh, certain uh, figures in The Lord of the Rings um, before changing colors. Um, uh, and uh, so uh, tall, much taller than most people, uh, dark, and, and basically one of those types of people who would you know, had a cell phone to God um, and literally would would be talking with someone and then just say, hold on a second. Yes, Father. Yes, Father. Okay, the answer to that question is this. God says, and so you, you clearly have uh, a, a radical individual here uh, does not believe in anything even remotely like Sola Scriptura. Um, and given a lot of what he said, I, I don't think could be identified as functionally Trinitarian. Um, not that he railed against the Trinity, just doesn't seem to have understood it. Um, and what's interesting, what we will see with Mathis and then his disciple, Jan of Leiden, the two Jans, these are the two, the two Jans and the two uh, Bernhards, uh, Rothman and, and Nipperdaling. Um, those are four of the most important names of what happens in Munster uh, between 1533 and 1535. Um, but what's interesting uh, is uh, when, you, when you look carefully at what happens during this time period, especially once the city is besieged, the city's going to be besieged for a lengthy period of time uh, for over a year, um, there is... Uh, a lot of singing and, and church services and a lot of singing of Luther's new hymn, A Mighty Fortress. They like, they love that because Munster was a fortress city and they were surrounded by walls. And, and so a mighty fortress and this is going to be the new Jerusalem. This is Zion. And, uh, but what was really interesting, even though there would be a great deal of scripture reading, there was a massive de-emphasis of the New Testament. There was a a tremendous uh, increase in emphasis upon uh, the Old Testament. Um, and so uh, there, is, there is no uh, balance or anything, even at the beginning. And what you're going to see is when you don't have the foundation at the beginning, once pressure is applied, um, any building that you attempt to build without a foundation is going to collapse. And what happens to it on the way down uh, can be rather uh, fascinating, and that is definitely what we have uh, what we have here. So what happens uh, is um, uh, we know that in 1532 Melchior Hoffman um, declares Christ will return to Strasbourg in 1533, um, and right at the end of this time period. Uh, Munster is undergoing Reformation as well. And so in February of 1533, now Munster is, a, is pretty much run by guilds. There is a, what's called a prince bishop, uh, Bishop Franz van Waldeck. Um, he is a, technically a Roman Catholic bishop, but he's married and he's very... Um, sympathetic toward uh, Lutheranism. Um, so he's, you know, he's not like, it's not like he's sold out to, you know, being the best servant of the Pope you could ever be. Um, but he is allegedly in control of the city, though the city has primarily, it's a very wealthy city, and it has primarily been run by the guilds. Uh, this was a major area of commerce. Uh, the people lived wonderful lives. They had nice homes. It was a safe city. Um, uh, the walls were thick, as you, well, as you can imagine. If it stands up to a siege for over a year, um, even when uh, the bishop who besieges it eventually uh, is loaned huge, massive cannon, one called the devil and the other called the mother of the devil. 
to to fire massive shells at these walls. They never were able to breach the walls. Uh, the people inside were able to repair them as fast as they could blow holes in them. So uh, it was a safe place. It's a beautiful place. Beautiful churches. It was just sort of a garden spot. A river running right through the city, a moat outside, the whole nine yards. It was, you know, what you would think of, a, of just a really nice medieval city. Um, and so uh, the, the city officially, by election, because, you know, the guilds run it, and so there's a town council, and, and they really have the power. I mean, they have to you know, sort of deal with the, with the bishop on one level or another, and there's a taxation system and stuff like that, but, you know, it, it's, it's primarily run by, by the people. It's not just, you know, it's not like the bishop has complete and total uh, control over everything. And so in, uh, in February of 1533, Munster officially becomes a Lutheran uh, city, and uh, Bishop uh, von Waldeck is, is not opposed to this in the sense of trying to crack the whip or anything like that. He's sort of like, he's sort of testing the winds and, and he is sympathetic toward Lutheranism. So he's sort of a in the middle type guy who is primarily there politically. It's not a big religious thing, though you can't avoid religion at this particular point uh, in time. And so uh, in the summer of 1533, uh, Bernard Rothman, is convinced by Melchior Hoffman to leave Lutheranism and to uh, become friendly toward Anabaptist uh, concepts and Anabaptist uh, movements. Uh, so he embraces the belief that infant baptism is invalid, that adults must be rebaptized. And Rothman is an excellent writer, uh, he's a very good communicator. At this time, the language of most of the people in northern Germany into the Netherlands, places like that, the languages were close enough, low German, and, and you could communicate. Uh, you might go, eh, once in a while, what? Um, but uh, you could communicate. And so um, his huge advantage and something that you know, we need to take into consideration in analyzing these things and making application today um, is, of course, the printing press now exists, and he's got one. Uh, so he has a press. Not everybody did, obviously. Uh, these days, thanks to the Internet, everybody's got a printing press. Um, back then, that obviously wasn't the case, and if you had one, um, then, and enough, and most people in this area, in, in Munster, were, had some money. They had some, uh, they had some resources. Uh, so he could buy paper and he could uh, do what he needed to do to produce things. He begins writing uh, tracts and booklets that are first focused on the Catholic Church, uh, infant baptism, the basic stuff you'd expect, but over time swing farther and farther into an Anabaptist uh, perspective. And he has a friend, a, wealth, a wealthy wool merchant, by the name of Bernard Nipperdalling. Uh, he was probably about 14 before he could finally figure out how to spell his last name. But, um, and uh, so uh, Nipperdalling likewise utilizes his resources uh, to help distribute Rothman's material. Uh, primarily in northern Germany. As I said, southern Germany had primarily been lost to the Reformation after the, um, after the Peasants' Revolt. Um, there was a, a, a detestation of Luther uh, for they, they, they viewed like he had betrayed them when he had told the princes to put down the rebellion. And uh, so the material is primarily staying in the north and is finding a tremendously um, wide audience of people that are willing to read and to, uh, and to listen and uh, so Rothman's material begins to uh, convince many people in Munster to move beyond Lutheranism uh, and instead embrace the Anabaptist theology of Melchior Hoffman. Uh, so Bernard Rothman and his allies take over political office in Munster because, again, this was, these offices were primarily done via election, and Munster was primarily under the control of guilds, and, but it was very what we would call democratic or representational, uh, that type of thing. 
And uh, so uh, Bernard Rothman, Bernard Nipperdaling, uh, Bernard Nipperdaling becomes the mayor of Munster after deposing the Lutheran magistrates who until then had seen him as an ally. And so you've now got three, you've got the Catholics that are still there, you've got the Lutherans that are still there, and now this growing group of Anabaptists uh, that are there. Um, and so what happens, that what, what really sets everything off is one of Hoffman's disciples, Jan Mathis, uh, again, that really funky looking dude, um, in January of 1534, he identifies Munster as the new Jerusalem. And a number of his disciples then go to Munster, uh, as does uh, he, and uh, begin doing public baptisms of adults. Um, and on one day, 1,000 adults were, were rebaptized there in the city of uh, Munster. Now, Munster had about, it's hard to say, but around 10,000 uh, normal residents uh, within the city walls, approximately. That number's going to change a lot during this time period, and who it is is going to change a lot during this time period, as you're going to see. In fact, just over the next 60 days, there's going to be a huge difference. Rothman begins uh, inviting people through his writings to come to Munster, uh, where they are going to have freedom and, and, and so on and so forth. And so the uh, population begins to change rather radically with this sudden influx of, uh, of Anabaptists. And of course, you had had the prophecy about 1533 in Strasbourg, and oh, oh, we missed it by a year, it's Munster. Okay, let's, let's head that direction type of a of a situation. People who are willing to believe one prophecy are probably willing to believe a second one, even though the first one failed. And um, so you have this uh, large movement, large-scale immigration into, uh, into Munster, which of course is extremely troubling to the bishop uh, and to others watching this uh, uh, taking, uh, taking place, but they're not really a thousand percent certain exactly what to do. Um, so on February 10, 1534, Bernard Nipperdaling, mayor of Munster, joined the Anabaptist movement to overthrow the town council and the bishop, uh, Anabaptist prophets Jan Mathis. And then Jan was accompanied by one of his own disciples, a young man at this time age 24, by the name of Jan of Leiden or Jan Bockelson. There are a couple different names that are used for him at this particular point in time. And the only way I could probably describe for you Jan of Leiden, uh, the young man, uh, he doesn't look anything like Jan Mathis. Uh, as far as we can tell from the historical records, probably would have been like a Brad Pitt at 24, okay? Uh, musically talented, an actor, um, just a, a master of manipulating people uh, with awesome good looks. And um, he is second fiddle for now. There's all sorts of speculation as to whether he organizes becoming first fiddle later on or just took advantage of what was happening or whatever it might be. We'll see here in a moment. But uh, as, you, as you put these guys in your mind, Jan Mathis needs to be the six foot five. Um, who was the who was the bad guy in uh, in in the Lord of the Rings? Saruman. Yeah, Saruman. Yeah, I guess. Uh, yeah, the dark, yeah. pointy hat carrying a. I, I mean, literally. I mean, that's how he's described. I mean, uh, there's just there's no other way to. If you want something that a lot of people would have seen, the connected. That, that's what he looks like. So that's how you guys see Jan Jan Mathis. Uh, but now you've got this uh, Jan of Leiden who's at his side, and he's he's just he's very different um, than than Jan Mathis is. And uh, these guys come into come into Munster and uh, begin uh, preaching the necessity of having a pure congregation, the congregation of Christ, uh, the community of Christ. That's what they call themselves. Uh, and, you know, the rest of the townspeople are sort of like, 
it sort of sounds like they don't want us around. Uh, and the more and more of them that show up, but, but no one knew what to do about it. Um, and so there is a brief um, couple weeks of transition taking place where Mathis is getting his feet under him. And then I believe it was around February 27th, 1534, uh, Mathis would have these, I cannot help but just simply point out that the description, the physical description provided by people who saw it of when Jan Mathis would hear from God has stunning parallels to the descriptions of what would happen when Muhammad received revelations that became part of the Quran. Um, there, you know, there could be almost a fit that takes place, or a lot, lack, lack, loss of consciousness, or 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 a, a stupor and, and mumbling and yes, Lord, you know, type thing. Um, but uh, he begins preaching loudly in the in the square of the city that the the congregation of Christ must be pure, and those who are unbelievers must be delivered over to Satan, and they must be killed and he he's he's basically saying we need to wipe out not just the catholics but the lutherans too well whether it was jan of leiden or just who of his allies are come to him and say you know um if we do this um it's going to unite every mayor and every prince for 50 miles around uh, and they are going to come and crush us, and we will not be ready for them. Uh, this is this is radical. You've got to rethink this. And so, so Jan modifies his uh, his perspective a little bit. Now, already uh, they are cramming everything they can cram into storehouses in Munster because they are already assuming that the prince bishop will besiege the city because they have rejected his authority. Um, and so they are storing up everything that they can store up. And they've got a few weeks to do this. And like I said, it's a rich city. They're buying everything they can get their hands on. It's one of the reasons the siege lasted as long as it did. Um, and so on February 27th, 1534, uh, a bitter cold day in the morning, uh, Mathis and the Anabaptists uh, drive all the Catholics and all the Protestants, uh, I'm sorry, all the Lutherans, um, out of the city. They are only allowed to take what is on them. Now, there had been an earlier deportation, actually. It hadn't been as violent, and it wasn't at such a horrible time. Uh, you were allowed to like take a cart, what you could carry, uh, but you weren't allowed to take food or anything like that. Now, this deportation, this forceful one on February 27th, uh, is when there is uh, snow and sleet. It is freezing cold, um, and it doesn't matter who you are, and you're not allowed to take anything, even a jacket. You're just driven out of the city, and everything you own becomes a part of the city's common treasure. Um, so, you know, pregnant women are giving birth in the streets. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a horrific situation. And they are driven out of the city on February 27th. And as a result, uh, when the storm clears and the fog clears, uh, the people of Munster look out and they see the bishop's troops uh, in line forming a cordon around the, around the city. And the siege has, uh, has begun. Now, uh, that siege, while it's going to last until the next summer, um, is, shall we say, porous. Um, the, the forest comes close to the city and there are a lot of underground passages and all sorts of stuff like that. And so while the city is besieged and you can't have, you know, like wagons of food or something coming in, uh, Rothman's going to continue getting his pamphlets out. Uh, people are going to go in and out. Um, it, it's, it's not a it's, it's a porous situation until early the next year when the bishop starts building a literally a solid wall all around Munster, which is already three miles round to begin with. And so it's a big wall. But he realized, I need to, this is like a cancer, I need to, need to completely seal it off. 
Um, so the siege begins then uh, early March, late February of uh, 1534. Now, what begins to happen is a tremendous study over the next literally number of weeks uh, into the fall is a is a amazing study in human nature. Um, Melchior Hoffman was a pacifist. There was no violent aspect of his theology, and yet over the next number of weeks, um, it is going to become commonplace in the city of Munster. They estimate there were about 9,000 in the city when it was besieged. So between the Anabaptists coming in and then the Catholics and the others being driven out, and those who, by the way, didn't want to leave, just had to be baptized. Um, what's interesting is if you were in the last groups that were baptized at one point, just to show you the, the mental warfare that Mathis and Leiden somehow knew to use, um, at one point, uh, all those people who had, were the last, in the last group to be baptized... Mathis uh, questioned their faithfulness. And so he had them all gathered and stuck inside a church for a number of hours. And, well, remind me to tell you about that because I'm, I'm going out of context. I'm sorry. They, what's going to happen over the next six months is you're going to have such violence. Beheadings are going to become a normal thing. Uh... Uh, Bernard Nipperdaling uh, becomes uh, the, the bearer of the sword once Jan, Jan of Leiden is going to become king. Um, and there's going to be executions. And, and at one point, um, polygamy is going to be introduced, forced polygamy amongst Anabaptists who are very prudish people. Um, and at, at one point, Jan's going to have 16 wives. And one of them is going to turn against him. And so he's going to take her in the city square and he's going to behead her in front of everybody. And then he and the rest of his wives are going to dance around the headless body. I mean, this happens in a matter of months. And you're left going, what? How? How? What? But no way. This is, this is, this is stuff of a Hollywood movie, but it didn't happen in history. Yeah, it, it happened in history. And it happened fast. And it, le it, it, just, it left all of Europe going... Wow. And when these stories get out, and of course, some of the stories become exaggerated over time as well. Um, this is why uh, Anabaptists were feared uh, forever. So, what happens is early on in, in March, Mathis, Jan Mathis, who is now the prophet, he speaks for God. Um, he does not receive revelations that he, he doesn't even get involved in arguing things like canon or scriptural sufficiency or something like that. Uh, he's a prophet. He speaks for God. Um, the end of the world is coming, and uh, this is Zion, and this is the place to be. And so uh, you and I would have all sorts of theological questions about this, but... Uh, what happens is, once the siege starts, then there's immediate organization of everyone in the city into a paramilitary style life. You have to, there's all sorts of secret passages in and out, and there's gates and stuff like that, and you have, they have to be guarded day and night. And, and uh, in fact, it's going to become a two-way street over the next number of months. Um, you would think the Anabaptists would stay behind the walls and are nice and safe. No. They become nighttime terrorists. And they will sneak out at night and they will head into uh, the encampment of one of the, of some of the uh, soldiers of the, of the bishop prince and slit all their throats and burn their, burn their gunpowder and destroy their cannons. And, and I mean, they are, the, the bishop prince is, is amazed at the uh, tactics. They can't break out. They can't. There's too many. But man, they certainly make life interesting uh, in the darkness. And of course, they're all the locals. Most of the people the bishops bring in 
or either local farmers do work or, or mercenaries. They don't know the area. These people know the area like the back of their hands. And so they, they can disappear into the darkness and you have no idea how they got there, where they went or anything else. Um, and so there's, a, there's warfare going on. The one thing that Munster was short on was sulfur. And you need to have sulfur for gunpowder. And so they only had so much. And so they, they really tried to not use weapons. They had cannon. They had cannon up on the ramparts in really nice reinforced locations. And that kept the bishop's forces. They had to stay far enough out to stay out of range of the cannon that were in Munster. And so you've got this dead zone, basically, around Munster. It's a no man's land. Uh, and then outside of that, the bishop's forces set up. That's pretty, it's a fairly large area uh, that you're trying to do. And of course, the prince bishop has to pay these soldiers. And he's getting support from both Catholics and Protestants to do so. Because both Catholics and Protestants see this is not what we want happening in our place. And so, yes, uh, Von Waldeck, we will loan you this amount of money or we'll give you this amount of money. But it's still extremely expensive. And of course, the last thing he wants to do is blow up his own city. Uh, I mean, every shell he lobs into that city is damaged and he's after repair. So he's in a tough spot. He really doesn't know exactly what to do here. Well, once you're in a besieged city, oof, it changes the way people think. And so what happens is early on, there is a man, a blacksmith. Now, you, know, you, think, of, you think of blacksmiths in in movies about this time. They, they do not, well, let's just put it this way. Pick it up and anvil, you know, that type of thing. Anvil on the belt, put it down, all right, you know, that type of thing. They're big men, you know? And so there is a blacksmith that everybody knew in Munster, he'd been there forever, by the name of Herbert Rusher. Herbert Rusher. And one night, Herbert Rusher is on guard duty, and he was in a lousy spot. It was a cold spot. They didn't really have a whole lot to keep them warm. The soldiers are right over there, and they've got fire, and they got, you know, they're, they're doing real nice. And so not everybody's happy over on the Herbert Rusher side. And Herbert Rusher thinks that Jan Mathis is a jerk. Uh, he's, he's a weirdo, and, and he's, he's, you know, what, what is going on here? How have we allowed this to happen type stuff? But he thinks everybody around him is his friend, and so he's safe. But Mathis has already begun to encourage a, an atmosphere of great fear. He's encouraged children to report on their parents. Eventually, laws will be passed. For example, you could never lock the door of your house. Your door always had to be open. Uh, anybody could come in and check on what you're doing at any time. And both Jans were your classic cult-leading conspiracy theorist wackadoodles um, and are thinking that everyone's always out to get them. And so um, word is reported to Jan Mathis uh, about what Herbert Rusher has said. And so there's different stories as to where he was arrested and how he was arrested and stuff like that, but Herbert Rusher is brought before Jan Mathis and the large portion of the town populace in the city square, which is the, how things were done back then. And he is uh, bound with, his, uh, with a heavy rope and his hands are behind his back. And uh, so Jan Mathis begins to, uh, begins to preach about how God has told him that there are unbelievers amongst what's supposed to be the pure congregation of Christ. And that these unbelievers must be cut off from the land of the living. So people start looking at each other. They all know Herbert Rusher. He's probably made things for a bunch of them. And so a couple of these guys who are Anabaptist leaders, they are on board. Come up to Jan Mathis and they're like, we have, we have rules, we have laws. We, we don't just execute people in the city square for the fun of it. Um, that there's, there has to be a trial, and there has to be, and Mathis has them thrown in prison. And then 
The stories differ, but it seems like the most probable is that when it looks like Mathis might waver in himself executing Russia, Jan of Leiden steps forward, grabs a uh, one of these pikes, these long spear type things that were used in warfare, and comes up behind Russia and stabs him in the back, puts him on the ground. Right in front of everybody. Well, Rusher, poor guy, is a strong guy, and it doesn't kill him. He's just laying there on the ground, screaming and moaning, which doesn't look good. And so Leiden goes over to one of the guards, takes his pistol, you know, they were the cap pistol, the ball, and walks up to him and shoots him in the head at point blank range. Those weren't the most effective pistols in those days. Um, still doesn't kill him. Um, and so um, people come out of the crowd. They pick him up. They take him to his home. Uh, and he dies eight days later. Eight days later. The people are stunned. This is the context in which Jan Mathis says, The Lord has revealed to me that there are some of you who are not true believers, those of you who are in that last group that were baptized in the last deportation. You know, before we kicked all the Catholics and Lutherans out, you were baptized then. Gather them all up and put them in the church. Well, you just saw one of the strongest men in the, in the whole city stabbed in the back and shot in the head. Um, and you're left in there for hours. By the time Jan Mathis walks in, they're all just on their knees, weeping and crying for mercy. And what Jan Mathis does is he kneels down next to them and he goes into his trance thing and he says, Oh, I thank you, Father, that you've allowed me to be merciful to these, your people. Oh, and they are so thankful. That is manipulation like you can't believe. I mean, that's how you make fanatical disciples. You get them in fear of their life, and you show them mercy. Except you're the one that was threatening them in the first place. I don't know where these guys learned this stuff, but wow, were they good at it. So this is very quickly the attitude and the mindset of what's going on in Munster. If it, you know, and, and of course, people start accusing other people and, and uh, all the rest of this stuff, and so there's a huge amount of fear, but there's also a whole lot of religiosity going on. There would be lengthy readings from primarily the Old Testament, and there was a singing of Anabaptist hymns, and like I said, uh, the soldiers outside of Munster could hear wafting over the walls of the singing of a mighty fortress is our God. It was one of the favorites of the, uh, of the Anabaptists in, uh, in Munster. Around Easter, of 1534, so April. So it's only been a little over, you know, six weeks maybe? Um, there is a wedding taking place. And it's a big feast. This is a rich city. Their storehouses were still full. It only been a few weeks. And so there is a wedding feast going on and Jan Mathis is there with the people. And all of a sudden, you know, he's been sitting there sort of contemplating and all of a sudden, uh, and head on the, on, the, on the table. Out like a light. And everybody's like, what, 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 what do we do? Is, is there a revelation coming? You know, so everybody's like, and so when he comes to, he's, like, he's going, yes, Father, as you will. Yes, Father, as you will. He stands up and he kisses everybody and leaves. And everybody's like, what just happened? So what he does is he has a personal guard. He chooses, stories differ, between 12 and 30 of his personal guard. I, I think 12 has a better possibility. It sounds good and apocalyptic. Chooses about 12 men to go with him. And on Easter Sunday, 1534, Jan Mathis straps on his sword, spear, armor with 12 men rides out the main city gate of Munster he is going to go defeat as the man of God 
all the armies of the bishop prince, Prince Bishop, which at this time is around 8,000 men. Okay? And so everybody in the city rushes to the walls because you've got this dead zone because of their cannon where there's, you, you can watch. And out they ride, and as they watch the bishop's forces out on the far hill, uh, before long, here comes a column of about 500 cavalry, uh, their elite forces, against 13 people. And they hit, clash, 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 it's over fast. And they tear Jan Mathis to pieces. They stick his head on a pike and plan outside the city. And then I'll let you figure out the rest of this for yourself, but they hung certain parts of him on the city gate that night just to make sure that everybody in that city knew what had happened to their great prophet. What an amazing turn of events. There have been stories, you know, uh, of people defeating dragons and stuff like that. And people believe these things that actually happened. Uh, St. George and the dragon and all the rest of this stuff. And so that's what they were expecting to happen. But now what in the world are we going to do? We've rebelled against the Prince Bishop, thinking that Jan Mathis hears from God, and he heard from God, and God told him to go do this, and he, his guts are still laying out in the, in the field. And everybody went, that went with him, same thing. They're all just torn to shreds. Not a single survivor. What do we do now? Well, it didn't take long for the rumor to start going around the city. He's going to rise on the third day. Hmm. Huh. Mm. Well, before the third day, the trumpets sound, and everyone is summoned to the city square. And high above them, on a balcony that can be seen by everyone in the darkness, light shines forth and out walks Jan of Leiden. And he's with Bernard Nipperdalling, and he's with the widow of Jan Mathis, who herself was supposed to be quite the stunning lady. And what Jan does, remember, he's an actor. Oh, he knows how to make an entrance. What Jan does is he says it was Jan Mathis' time to die because he was arrogant. And God never told him to take those other men with him. He was to go alone. He wasn't to cause their deaths. And so God struck him down. But God is not finished with us and with our city. This is still Zion. This is still the community of Christ. And God revealed to me eight days ago this was going to happen. He calls Bernard, is it Bernard de Berdaling or Roth, Rothman? One of the two Bernards forward, and they verify that Jan of Leiden had told, had, had this dream, and he had told him about it, that he had seen Mathis killed, and, and how he was going to die, the whole nine yards. That's how they put down the rumor that Jan Mathis was going to rise again, and in the process, establish Jan of Leiden as his successor. He's received revelation. He's received visions that are true. And God told him to marry Jan of Mathis' widow. Jan of Leiden's already married. So that's a problem. Um, but now you have new leadership. And it is Jan of Leiden has now taken over. This would have been the perfect time for the bishop to move. But the bishop was not a military guy. And he made no move against the city, even though its leader had just been chopped to pieces uh, rather easily by his own forces. And so now Jan of Leiden is in control. The siege has only been a matter of weeks. It's going to last for another year. It's going to last for another year, more than a year, under Jan of Leiden's leadership. And in a matter of weeks, a jewelry maker is going to show up out of nowhere. Nobody even knew who he was. The prophecy from God that Jan of Leiden is king of Zion in the, in the manner of David. And he is going to be made king of the Anabaptists in Munster. And so uh, he 
at first is just simply the leader and he continues what Jan Mathis was doing and as I mentioned one of the primary things that uh, Jan the, the two Jans are intent upon doing is establishing what could only be described as a fully communist uh, state there in Munster um, and so it really does become a reign of terror uh, over the next number of well for the rest of the time only the terror increases and then as starvation begins to become a reality um, you have this insane mixture of uh, people dying of starvation and the desperation that comes from that and yet Jan and his court because in a few months I'll mention in a moment he'll uh, be made king so you have a, a monarchy in a communist system which is rather odd when you think about it but what happens is you you're supposed to bring all of your basically all of your worldly goods um, you're only supposed to have a certain amount of clothing and all the rest of the clothing you bring into the storehouses and all your your gold your silver or riches or anything is brought uh, to the storehouses and then as you have need as anyone has need you just go to the storehouse and and get uh, what you what you need um, but everyone's supposed to be on the same same level and um, so Jan uh, continues uh, this um, but then there is also an increase in well as I mentioned before the, the Old Testament is the primary scripture of the Anabaptists or whatever you want to call them in uh, in Munster and so there is a strong uh, theocratic concept uh, it's almost divine revelation uh, Jan Mathis was more open about sort of being a prophet um, but once you get started you know people can come along and uh, once you've sort of expanded the canon and allow for new revelation uh, then other people can come along and how can you be overly critical somebody just pops up and says God just told me X Y or Z um, if you've got your power because somebody before it said God told me X Y and Z then it's hard to be overly critical about what someone's saying now and so what happens um, is that during one of the public processions Jan has uh, has basically uh, well, I, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me let me let me back up. There is a, a fascinating reality that takes place, and and that is, I did I mention to you the first whoops attack uh, against the city? Yes, no, maybe I guess not. Um, the Prince Bishop von Waldeck uh, is under a lot of pressure to attack the city. And remember, we they, he has been given these huge cannon, the devil and the mother of the devil. Um, and uh, all sorts of other uh, artillery pieces. And so in uh, May, they decide it's time to, to move against, uh, against the city. He doesn't want to do this because it's his city. He doesn't want to blow it up. He's got to repair all this anyways. So uh, they start firing cannons and uh, try to blow holes in the walls of Munster, and they're going to attack the next day. Well, the problem is almost everybody in the army are mercenaries, and mercenaries tend to like to drink. And so there was one group of mercenaries that really liked to drink, and uh, so as the cans are going boom, 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 they're pouring it down. And they sort of pass out, and at least enough of them wake up at sunset. But they're so confused, they think they missed the call to head toward the city at sunrise. <laughs> And so they're worried that they're not going to get any booty once they get in, you know, that's because that's where the, the, the mercenary, you know, you get to go to the city, sort of ransack stuff. And if you run to some rich guy's house, you know, you stick some stuff in your pockets. That's how you make all your extra money. And so they're like, oh, dude, uh, I don't really think it's the terminology they used, but the, the <laughs> sort of old German version of, oh, dude. Um, and so they start running toward the city because they figure they've been left behind. So all the other soldiers who are just getting ready to go to bed are like, did we miss something? Well, now they're going to get all the... And so all of a sudden there is this at dark, utterly disorganized attack on the city with the sun going down instead of going up. Well, 
um, the, the Anabaptists rush to the walls and it does not take very much for them to uh, uh, get rid of drunk soldiers in the dark uh, when you're up on the walls throwing stuff down to people down below and uh, the, the attack is, is repulsed with uh, basically no, no injury to the people in the city but uh, numerous, of, especially the drunk soldiers, uh, ended up at the bottom of the moat dead or whatever else it might be. So. The whole attack of the next day is called off, and, and the Prince Bishop is like, oh, good grief. And the people inside the city are like, yeah, we've been delivered. And so that was the, the first thing. Then, during the, uh, during the summer, um, there was a fellow by the name of Johann Dussenscher from Warendorf, a lame goldsmith. Um, he had a powerful talent for arousing his listeners to a fervent pitch of enthusiasm. I'm reading from the Taylor King here. Uh, not either, even Rothman or Krechting or Nipperdaling uh, praised Yan so effusively. Um, and so there's this one day where, where Yan comes before the people and he's all humble and, you know, I, I just don't know if I can do what, what God's called me to do. You people deserve such better leadership, so on and so forth. And he's humbling himself. In the midst of this, this Johann Dussenster, the goldsmith, the lame goldsmith, comes forward and he starts preaching. He says, did Yan's people realize, uh, he says to the growing crowds, that they had, a, they had a biblical hero in their midst. Jan was no mere prophet. He was the one that the prophets anticipated. He was more than a man. He was a veritable David, a return to be their king. And so somehow he opens up his bag. And what does he have in his bag but a scepter and a crown and royal accoutrements that just happens to have with him. And he places them upon uh, Yan's head. And Yan sits upon a throne and... You know, he, he, at first, he's just very, I, I'm, just, I'm just so humbled, you know, that the Lord would do this for me and all that. But then very quickly, I mean, in the same hour, he's really taking to this and basically saying, now you all, you all need to get with the program now. And, and uh, you know, I'm going to assign a royal court and, and the whole nine yards. And a lot of people are sort of like, hmm, this seems extremely convenient uh, that this all worked out this way. But hey you've already pretty much um, invested yourself in this visions from God stuff and things like that. So, um, and Yan cracks the whip hard against anyone who would, uh, who would question uh, his, uh, his rulership. And so uh, in August, you know, he's now king and he has, um, he's assigned people to be the court executioners. And you can bring people before him for judgment, and if you have a rebellious wife, for example, uh, you can bring her before King Anne, and uh, if he finds that uh, she she has not been obeying as she is supposed to obey, well, uh, sometimes you had imprisonment, uh, but very often uh, Nipperdaling or one of the others uh, had that sword, which you can still see in the museum in uh, in uh, uh, Munster to this day. And uh, you didn't just run people through. Beheading happened a lot in, uh, in Munster. So one nice fast swing and, uh, and uh, you've taken care of that particular, uh, that particular issue. And so there is a uh, uh, rules are passed, for example. You cannot lock your door. Uh, you cannot close your door. It, it, it always must remain ajar. And at any point, at any time, someone can simply walk through your door and make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Um, that you're, you're, supposed, you're being a good citizen of, of Munster. And there were certain people in the city that liked doing that kind of thing, and we all know those kind of folks. Um, uh, and so there was, there was great fear uh, that is going on within, within the city. Well, uh, a few months after the failed attempt, again, more pressure is mounting on uh, von Waldeck, the prince bishop, to get this over with. And so they finally... Uh, uh, <laughs> command that no one drink one day um, and uh, as, uh, this sort of plan that with the attack. It's best to have sober uh, soldiers than drunk ones. And so in August, late August, 1534, they uh, again open up with the, the devil and the devil's mother. 
uh, and uh, they're blowing holes in the wall, and of course then the women are running in and filling up the holes with uh, all sorts of stuff. Um, but uh, there's a lengthy period of bombardment, and then the, uh, the attack begins. Let me read you a description of, uh, of the attack. Uh, the bishop's men were confident that their overwhelming numbers and the long bombardment must have terrified the Anabaptists. They always, just my comment here, they, they always thought of the people in Munster as just simply shopkeepers and uh, just had a very low opinion of them uh, as far as having any military ability. Within minutes, the attackers had sent across scaling ladders and grappling hooks, set explosive mines against the gates, and established a position at the base of the inner wall. Soldiers hoisted the long, heavy ladders into place and scrambled awkwardly up them, encumbered by their armor and their weapons. These men were hardened professionals, veterans of campaigns in Spain, Italy, and France, and accustomed to violence and hardship. Their opponents were only shopkeepers, smiths, tailors, and housewives, but they were fighting both their lives and for God. The hapless mercenaries could not have anticipated the fury they would encounter on this summer morning. Some had their hands hacked off as they grasped the top rungs of their ladders. Some were battered through their helmets with heavy notched clubs. Some were cloven with broadswords. Some run through with spears. Those climbing behind the leaders looked up to see the strong arms of two men on either side of their ladder holding posts and tree limbs between them, which they dropped together, stripping the ladder of five or six men at a stroke. The women, who had for months stirred their cauldrons of boiling pitch and quicklime in anticipation of this day, dashed the caustic liquid in the faces of the enemy soldiers and poured it down their armor, or made lighted necklaces, which they threw upon the men as they scurried frantically around the base of the wall. The men on the ladders fell backward into the moat, and some of those waiting below jumped into it, hoping to escape the quicklime that dissolved their flesh or the pitch that seared it, only to find the weight of their armor dragging them to their deaths. The surviving soldiers managed to make their way back across the inner moat and through the breached outer wall to the second moat. There, in a narrow defile of thorn, hedge, thorn hedges, hundreds of the company of Christ were hidden in the bushes, lying in wait to slaughter the soldiers as they returned in panic from the horror they had faced the walls. As night fell, the Anabaptists retreated into the city and raised their voices in song, A mighty fortress is our God. Wow. Now, um, there were hundreds of... Uh, von Waldeck's soldiers that uh, were killed uh, in the attack. I think there were 15 Anabaptists uh, that lost their lives in, uh, in the attack. So it was uh, a major victory. Uh, King Yan, uh, by all accounts, even by those who did not like him at all, uh, said that uh, despite arrows raining down and the bombardment and bombs and everything else, uh, he uh, rode uh, around uh, the battle lines on a white charger, just evidently utterly insensible to uh, the dangers, uh, giving commands, and did a great job, uh, and obviously greatly increased the um, stature that was his uh, in, in the city. And of course, it was decided after this um, that what needed to be done was to completely cordon off the city now uh, with a wall. Um, and starve them out. Uh, despite how many head of cattle they still had and things like that, uh, this was the only way to be able to, um, to do it. Um, during this time, in, this, in, the, in the fall, late summer, fall period, um, Yan sends out 12 apostles. Uh, you can still get small numbers of people in and out at, at night, you know, because you don't have night vision goggles and stuff like that, and there's woods around. And uh, he sends out 12 apostles to get help in uh, the fight against the prince bishop. And, of course, inside the city, there's very quickly rumors, for example, of the conversion of the, of the king of England. Um, the king of England has been converted, and he's going to come help us against the <laughs> prince bishop. And, and this, that, and the other thing. These 12 apostles are having great... Uh, success. The reality is that they were all very quickly rounded up and all but one were executed uh, brutally and cruelly uh, forthwith. But one of these uh, individuals um, was, a, was Henry Grays, the former schoolmaster in Munster. And he was captured, was going to be executed... But hearing someone speaking in Latin, which he himself could speak, he was a schoolmaster, um, he began a conversation with someone, and because of his education, was not looked upon as a just a bumbling someone from Munster. 
and he basically struck a deal. And the deal was、uh, he would go back in the Munster. They would come up with a believable story.、Uh, he would go back in the Munster, and he would spy upon the city, and then escape to give the Prince Bishop the information he needed to to bring about the end of the siege. Evidently, he, you know, at the beginning of everything, he had sort of stood against it, but then evidently became a believer, but then became an unbeliever once he got out, and so. The story he came up with、um, was that he was in his prison cell, about to be taken to the gallows, and an angel of the Lord appeared and instructed him what he was to do. And the next thing he knows, he finds himself. Well, what they did is they they took him at night and they snuck him to one of the gates in chains and then left him under a bush. And so he starts crying for help out there. And it's during the winter, so it is frigid cold. But they couldn't exactly wrap him up in a nice cloak or something, so he's out there freezing. Well, the guards hear him inside, but they figure it's a trap. We'll, we'll wait for sunlight. <laughs> so by the time they finally come out and and find him, he's about dead.、Uh, so they start rubbing on his body and you know doing something. They they bring him in because they recognize who he is, and、uh, he recovers. And tells this story of you know the deliverance by the angel of the Lord back to Zion,、uh, the holy city, and、uh, he's believed, and is very quickly,、uh, once he fully recovers, brought into the very inner circle of King Jan, and、uh, gets to observe everything、uh, in a straightforward fashion. And so, what he is going to eventually do is get another vision from God. Or he is to go to southern Germany and raise support in southern Germany. This is months later,、um, and、uh, he leaves Munster, goes straight to the Prince Bishop, and、uh, gives him all the information、uh, on what's going on inside the、uh, the city. And this is a part of what ends up、um, happening、uh, in the eventual downfall.、Um, so,、uh, for example, one of the rumors、uh, when they first sent the apostles out. Uh, Henry the Eighth had been rebaptized into their faith, and now now recognized King Yan as his sovereign.、Uh, an Anabaptist army was about to invade Rome, the citadel of Satan, and overthrow the Pope. In the Netherlands, thousands of supporters were aiming or arming their ships for an expedition shortly after the New Year to rescue the besieged city of Munster. So everybody wanted to believe the good news.、Uh, the problem is, all of it was completely false, and、uh, that's what、uh, what happened. In that、uh, in that situation. Now,、um, let me see here.、Uh, there are a bunch of these quotes I wanted to make sure to get get in here.、Um, just to give you an idea of how bad things got in the in the city itself. On September 25th, as on other days, the fanfare of trumpets announced the imminent arrival of the king and his court. Now, wouldn't be so bad in September, but by December, January, February, March. Uh, the king's court was still eating well, while the people were starting to eat each other.、Uh, that was one of the part of bad things.、Um, riding his white stallion, preceded by nipper dolling and crechting on foot, all enclosed within a moving box of、uh, bodyguards, Jan rode slowly into the square and took his place on the throne. On one side of the throne, a young boy, a page, held a copy of the Old Testament. On the other, an older and stronger boy held a naked sword. A young woman was led before the throne, her head bare and her hands tied. Before her, her name was Elizabeth Holshern.、Uh, she was charged with having three times denied her husband his conjugal rights. The young woman said she had been assigned to her husband. Okay, stop.、Um, shortly, not overly sure, but shortly after Yan becomes king, he announces a revelation from God that, in light of the privileges of the patriarchs. The fathers in the Old Testament that God had commanded that the city of Munster adopt polygamy, and that every single woman must be married. And this, I mean, Anabaptists were sort of known. You know, you know think of Mennonites, okay?、Um, this is way beyond the line. There is a brief. And successful coup. Some men actually managed to capture Yan and most of his upper court and imprison them. 
problem was they hadn't thought through what to do now. And Yan's signaling through the jail window to supporters outside, and they're grabbing their cannon and rolling them up the street. And and if if they had had a plan, if they had opened the city gates, if they had signaled it, something, it could have ended right then. They didn't have a plan, didn't know what to do, didn't act quickly. Uh, the rest of the people in the city responded quickly. Uh, they were over. They were re-overthrown. Yan was put back in, in place, and everybody. That was involved with the brief rebellion was uh, torturously executed, publicly uh, torn apart, and so on and so forth、uh, over the next few weeks、uh, in the city square. So there had been a rebellion, and so as soon as Yan gets back in power after that, now he really cracks the whip, and the polygamy goes into full effect, and everybody has to be,、uh, every woman has to be married to somebody, even if they don't want to be. So. It is in that context. Then she was charged with having、uh, three times denied her husband with conjugal rights. The young woman said she had been assigned to her husband against her will, despite the preacher's earlier assertions that no woman should be forced to choose a husband, and she did not regard him as having any rights over her at all. She said in James Stair's translation, "Heavenly Father, if you are Almighty, see to it that I never move, never more in my life have to climb into this marriage bed." End quote. With that, King Yan decreed that she must pay with her life for violating the will of God. The two guards who had led the woman before the throne forced her to kneel, and Bernard Nipperdaling, though he was no longer the official sword bearer, cut off her head with a single stroke. The next day, September 26th, Catherine、uh, Kochenbecken was executed in similar fashion because she had taken two husbands. In the company of Christ, as Stair aptly puts it, polygamy was the Lord's will, polyandry the devil's. And so,、uh, I mean, can, can you imagine in a relatively small city? Not small by standards back then, but from our standards today,、um, there are public beheadings going on every single day. Every single day.、Um, not only does this help with the food supply issue, obviously, but、um, it it can it, it keeps the people in charge in charge.、Uh, they have the everyone under a tremendous a tremendous、uh, pressure. Now, in January 1535, this is interesting. Uh, Yan sends a a, a a book called Restitution that Bernard Rothman has written to Philip of Hesse, Luther, and Melanchthon. And if you remember the Marburg Colloquy, it was Philip of Hesse, Luther, Melanchthon, Zwingli. Zwingli's dead now,、um, and others were the ones that had met there in Marburg. And so,、uh, what's interesting is Luther then coined the title of that book I've mentioned to you, the Taylor King. In his response to Yan of Leiden,、um, he said, "Quote: For the scriptures and the prophets point to Messiah, through whom all was to be fulfilled, and this the Jews also believed. But you want to make it point to your tailor king, to the great disgrace and mockery of Christ." So that's where the phrase came from. As Luther was rip snorting in his in his response to,、uh, no, they were they were hoping to get support.、Uh, they did not get support.、Um, All of the、uh, magisterial reformers utterly rejected、uh, what was going on in、uh, in Munster, as did、um, Luther.、Uh, and so,、uh, remember when、um, Grays had left to go raise support in southern Germany?、Um, he actually went to the bishop, and then right around this time, he writes a letter to the people of Munster, and the they copy it with his signet ring, and they. And of course, you didn't. You didn't want to be found with one of them because Yan would kill you. Because the idea was, if you read it, then you'd tell other people about it. So, not, you know, even if they did find it, it's like ah, run away, you know, type of thing. But eventually, the, the letter would get to Yan. And、um, this letter came from Grays that everybody in the city knew, saying, "You've been deceived. You've been. You've been misled. This is all. You know, surrender. You know, so, so this this was a great、uh, danger to uh, Yan's uh, leadership at that particular point in time." One more story、um, that is fairly lengthy here, but I, I, it, it really struck me.、Um, Elizabeth was the blonde, beautiful daughter of Bernard von Schier, a blacksmith. She had been married at 19 years of age by force after the king's decree of polygamy to a man named Reiner Hardwick, and had tried unsuccessfully to run away from him through the city gate. Hardwick had then died, and her father had arranged for her to be married to an old man. Cadaverous, pockmarked, and bald. One August, Clotterburnd. Ooh, that just doesn't sound good one way or the other. 
One day in the late fall of 1534, as the king was holding court in the cathedral square, Elizabeth was brought to him for judgment, arms bound behind her by her father and her new husband. Bernard von Scheer complained that his daughter had been disobedient to him and that he should be allowed to punish her. August Clotterburn went further. He said that Elizabeth, though she was his pledged wife, had told him she would sooner sleep in the bushes than with him. He asked that King Yan pronounce on this rebellious woman an appropriate judgment. Yan asked Elizabeth if she had married Clotterburn of her own free will. She asked, according to Helmut Paulus's version of the story, how anybody could think that a young woman might want to marry such a stinking old goat. She would rather be three feet under the ground. The king reprimanded the old man and the girl's father for imposing their will on her unfairly and had her imprisoned in the Rosenthal for disobedience. A few days later, she became his tenth wife. Beautiful, spirited, and brave, Elizabeth was Yan's favorite wife after Queen Devara. Remember, Queen Devara is Jan Mathis' widow. Right. Jan, yeah, right. So, you know, the real... If you remember Jan Mathis and the whole um, 1970s rock band cover thing. But anyways, but uh, in early May, Elizabeth had grown difficult. Accounts varied. Some said she had been disturbed by the sad fate of the refugees Jan had turned away from the city gates. That... We're all the way into May for this particular story. People start to try to get out of the city as they're starving. But the Prince Bishop had said, the wall, there's now a wall all the way around the city. He said, no, we're not taking it. And it was a pitiful sight. You've got these people, these starving people, begging to be let out, and they're caught in this no man's land. Because once Yan said, you can leave, but you ain't coming back. And so they were dying out there in the wilderness. Uh, the Prince Bishop's soldiers would just kill the men. Um, some of the soldiers' wives were... were, were organizing food chains, they'd be throwing food over the wall at these people. It's just, it's just a horrible, horrible situation. And Elizabeth had seen this because Yan wouldn't let them back in. Um, uh, some said she had been disturbed by the sad fate of the refugees. Jan turned away from the city gates. Others said she had protested the starvation that was evident all around them, while she and the other members of the court were allowed to eat all they wished. Whatever the cause, the various accounts agree that Elizabeth reproached Jan for his inhumanity and demanded to be allowed to leave him and the city. Outraged at her ingratitude and her temerity, Jan led her to the market square and before the other wives in the assembled throng, I think by now he had 16 wives, um, and the assembled throng uh, that had been summoned condemned her to death. Helmut Paulus, adding a novelist's insight to the documents describing this incident, imagines Elizabeth's last moments as she hears the king say, God has commanded that you must die. This is the same test that Abraham faced. I cannot escape it. How strange those words sound to the young woman. Her lips draw back in scorn, but her eyes are shocked when she looks into the face of the king who stands before her, his back to the crowd. His eyes gleam with animal savagery. His lips are pulled back from his teeth. In great fear, she tries to stretch out her hands against the truth now revealed in his face that a mask had previously hidden, but her hands are bound behind her. She wants to scream, but she is gagged. She sees how the king takes the sword from the hand of Master Nyland. His, her hands are unbound, and she is lifted with inhuman strength and forced to kneel with her head on a block. She clasps her hands before her as she hears, and this, is, this actually happened, hears King Yan reproach the other wives. Listen to this. Why don't you sing? Sing! She hears the frightened voices of the women weakly like an ex exhalation singing in excelsis Deo. Glory to God in the highest. She sees a flash of light, feels a terrible pain, and drops into a dark sea. All now is peaceful and dark. Several graphic sketches of the king dancing with his other wives around the headless corpse of Elizabeth von Scheer have come down to us as perhaps the most vivid documentation of his depravity, and it was this incident more than any other that led serious observers to see Jan as indeed the devil in human shape. But perhaps the true devil in this scene is the one omitted by Paulus in his reconstruction, uh, the former Catholic priest Bernard Rothman, who looked on as the king in his court danced and said, glory to God in the highest. So, here, as it's getting bad, um, Yan decapitates his second favorite wife and then forces the other wives to dance with him uh, around her decapitated body in front of the populace. This is what has happened in Munster. So, there is a fellow by the name of Henry uh, Gresbeck who left Munster in May, May 23rd. He managed to find some kind guards on the wall, um, explained that he was himself a former soldier. Uh, he was taken to the Prince Bishop. Uh, over the next few weeks, he took men to secret entrances, demonstrated he'd get in and out of the city. Um, they then 
uh, sent about uh, 200 men with him. Uh, they snuck into the city uh, and invaded, and, and, but were discovered. And so there was fighting going on in the city. One of them managed to get away from the others who had taken up a defensive position, get up on the wall and signal for the, the Prince Bishop's uh, troops to come. The Anabaptists had abandoned their post to go inward for the fight. And so this is how eventually the Prince Bishop's army was able to breach the city. Uh, get in. There was fierce fighting for uh, an extended period of time during that day. The uh, Anabaptists had created what we would call tanks. They were armored carts, 16 of them in the city square, with cannons and everything. I mean, uh, they were going to use them to, to try to break out, but then once they ate their horses, that didn't, wasn't going to work very well. So, um, and so, but they were, you know, the Prince Bishop's forces were really concerned about those things because they didn't really have anything to deal with them. Um, but eventually, the city is uh, is taken. The soldiers had all been uh, charged to not kill the leaders. The leaders had to be executed properly. And so, what's interesting is um, they never found Bernard Rothman, the guy who wrote all the sermons. Um, Twenty years later, his wanted posters were still in Europe. Uh, what happened to him? No one knows. Uh, he could have been just so horribly mauled in the, by the soldiers uh, that didn't know who he was that could have been blown up into pieces, who knows. Or he might have gotten out. We don't know. We just don't know. He never surfaces again. There's, there's just no knowledge. But uh, Nipperdal and Kreshting and Yan of Leiden are all uh, captured alive. Um, and pretty much everyone else is killed. Uh, certainly all the men. Uh, all the Anabaptist men in the city. Uh, thousands. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, you're, if you're found in a house, even if you weren't involved in, in the last fighting, you're just right out in the street, you're run through with a sword and left to, left to die. And uh, you just pile the bodies up. And most of the women were, were killed uh, as well. It was an absolute slaughter in the city. Um, there is a period of time um, that passes while these people are in prison uh, where there is conversation. Yan even suggested to the Prince Bishop uh, that he uh, build three cages and parade he and Nipperdaling and Kreshting um, in the cages uh, around the Anabaptist areas where they could tell people that it was all foolishness and that they're wrong and so on and so forth and try to hold things down. And, and uh, maybe the Prince Bishop could make up some of his losses by charging to see the prisoners. Uh, but he knew what was going to have to happen. If all of their, his followers had already been executed, then he had to be executed as well. So finally, on January 22nd of 1536, in Munster, uh, where all of this took place, uh, carts were tied together with uh, boards placed across them with a central pole in the middle. The Prince Bishop sat up in Nipperdaling's uh, upper floor window, uh, the same one where Yan of Leiden had introduced himself to the people after Yan Mathis' death, um, to watch the proceedings. And uh, the law was that for this execution, uh, each person had to be tortured for exactly one hour. And they had to be conscious during the one hour. So if you passed out from the pain, they would revive you and subtract how long you're unconscious and keep track of a full hour. Um, the three men were all chained to the same pole. They had uh, uh, collars that had spikes facing inward on, um, so they really couldn't go anywhere. Uh, but you'd be, you know, the, there'd be, you know, if you got three people around one pole, you can sort of figure, you can sort of see one person over to one side or maybe, you know, like this, you, you might be able to see some things. Um, but you were only tortured one at a time. So, like the last guy would hear two hours worth of the torture of the other guys before he got it. So that's, from my, my, my opinion, he had it worst. The first one to go had it easiest. Um, they had a... Uh, they had tongs, sets of tongs, uh, in fire. So they were glowing red hot. And uh, so what they would do is, for an hour, they would tear your body apart. They'd just grab, pull, grab, pull, muscles, tendons, whatever, um, and just pull you apart for an hour, slowly, to the uh, entertainment of the crowd. 
And then once your hour was up, uh, they would just t- simply take a long knife and put it through your heart, and uh, you would be released from your suffering. Uh, and then they moved on to the next guy, who has been listening for an hour, knowing that his hour is coming, and then finally to the last one. So these three, Jan, Jan of Leiden, uh, Bernard Nipperdaling, and uh, Kreshning, were the ones who were executed in this, uh, you know, seems to us to be outrageously barbaric fashion, but this was, uh, this was agreed to by everybody in Europe. The Protestants and the Catholics together. Yes, that's what needs to happen. There wasn't anybody going, ah, mercy. No, no. Uh, look at what these people did. Look at the barbari- barbaric uh, situation they brought into existence. Their bodies are put in three cages and hoisted up above the clock on the St. Lambert Church Tower, which is one of the only church towers that Jan of Leiden hadn't had torn down. And there they stayed for 50 years. They're rotting corpses. Uh, dropping pieces of flesh on people attending church for 50 years. Uh, 50 years later, so about 1585, they pulled the cages down, took the bodies out, and then they put the cages right back up. And if you go to Munster, Germany today, they're still there. The very same three cages. In the 1800s, they had uh, taken them down to restore them. They were really well made. Uh, They cleaned them up, put them back up. World War II, a bomb hit that uh, church, damaged the steeple, knocked one of the three down. They repaired the steeple, put it right back up. And within the 21st century, a referendum was held in Munster. Should we take the cages down? The popular vote was, keep them up there. Keep them up there. A lot of lessons we can learn from it. How cults start and things like that. But we are completely out of time. 